Welcome to the Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel. Co-host of Escape from the City on the ABC and partner of Empower Wealth Advisory. Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of Empower Wealth Advisory. Named the 2018 and 2019 Property Advisory Firm of the Year. Stay tuned as they bring you the Insider's Guide to Property, Finance and Money Management. All right, folks, welcome back to the Property Couch. Hello, Ben, how are you? G'day, mate, how are we? Very good, thank you. Hey, uh, I'm excited, today's Q&A day. Mm, our first, first for one. 2020, very good. I know. but um, great, Some great, great questions too. I can't wait to get into There that. are some good ones. I'm yeah, looking forward to it as well. But um, you wanted, before we push record, you were obviously uh, excited to, um, that your AFLW team. Your girls are up and about, yeah, 2 top, and 0. Top of the ladder. They had, they had a bad couple of years, but you know, we, we beat our first, we beat our arch rivals Carlton for the first time. On Sunday, Arvo. So good on the girls. Well, just say, and Fremantle's still on top, Ben. So just <laughs> yeah. cool your jets. Of your confidence. And we're, and we're undefeated and, as well. And we're used to being on top. Uh, so our f- female team's always been very good. Very good team. So yeah. And you beat the West Coast. West I mean. Coast. Yes. Yeah, oh. Good work. So well done. Well done to the uh, AFLW. It's getting better and better. It's just a good competition. Can't wait to see it grow. Exactly. So uh, well done, folks. Um, I am going to do my mindset uh, minute theme today, Ben. And um, I'm going to do one where I think the first line, you're going to go, oh, gosh, we've heard this before. But are you ready? All right, go for it. Uh, you, do you know, Ben, that you are richer than 93% of people? In Australia or globally? Well, I'm glad you asked because they're good qualifying questions, right? But yep. not in money, but in time, Ben. Oh. Because you know how someone says that and they, you obviously know that the wealth distribution in the world is heavily stacked towards us in the West. Yep. But uh, not in money, but in time. 108 billion people, Ben, have lived throughout history. 93% of them are deceased. So what you have, um, so you have what every king, every queen, every pharaoh, every ruler, every CEO, CEO as well, <laughs> <laughs> and celebrity of the past would give all their wealth for, Ben. Today. Today. Hmm. Today. I thought you were going to do a did you know there for a second, but no, you brought it back to Let a that nice land. message. Let that land. And that was, of course, I cannot yeah. get enough of this guy's stuff, Ben, James Clear. Yes. That was, he just has these three thoughts and that was, and I thought, when I read that first one, I thought, okay, I've seen the distribution of wealth sort mm-hmm. of discussed before, but, yep. um, and I must admit, I have been focusing a lot on what is the, what is the good about what we've got today rather than what happened last, you yep. know, last week, what have we got coming up? So there you go, folks. Hopefully that might land for you. Um, that you have today and lots and lots of folks do not have that. So you're very, very fortunate. Beautiful. Hey, Q&A day. Q&A day. What do we, we got? We have got uh, a heap of questions that have been sent in and we have our team have put this on our desk, Ben, so that we uh, largely unprepared, which is uh, part of how... Yes, <laughs> I have read them this time, which yeah. is good. I did have a quick read of them too before. Um, but the first one's from Jack yes. on Brisbane versus Melbourne and mm. differing opinions. Yeah. So let's have a little listen to Jack's question now. Hi there, guys. I um, just want to say first up, I've only just tuned into your podcast recently and I'm absolutely loving it. I'm going to be uh, buying a couple of books too. They seem, they've seen got a lot of great reviews and, yeah, I'm really excited to read them. Fellas, I'm looking at starting my property investment journey about this time next year, December 2020. Now, I've been, I'm following a couple of property investors. One guy, he's currently investing up in Brisbane. This other guy that I follow as well, he stays purely local in Victoria, mainly Melbourne. He's explaining me with the growth corridors, uh, how they're not really growth corridors, uh, Pakenham, Wyndham Vale, Tarnie, Point Cook, and I've had a look in there. Yeah, they don't average as much as what I thought they would. Nice places, but yeah. I can't afford to invest in Melbourne itself. And the difference in the two is one saying uh, he's starting off people up in Brisbane, getting their introduction into the property market up in Brisbane uh, for around about the 500k mark. And the other guy who uh, invests only in Victoria, um, his suggestion was start out, say, somewhere like Bendigo or Ballarat. He doesn't believe Geelong's got good growth. Um, yeah, I'm hesitant to go Bendigo or Ballarat because they are inland, but I'm also afraid that my judgment's being clouded. Uh, I grew up in coastal areas. I've always lived near the coast. I've always loved the coast. If you guys give me your opinion, that'd be fantastic. Well done again on the podcast. I'm absolutely loving it, and I've watched seven episodes today. Okay, that was from Jack Ben. Um, before we go ahead, um, just want to say, Ben, late last year, you and I decided that we would approach our publisher and we would buy some books 
and give them out to folks if they're prepared to pay for shipping. Now, that actually yep. went really well yep. over Christmas. Quite a few people put their hands up. So yep. just saying that we are going to every now and then go and buy some more books, Ben, yep. um, put them up. So if people want to go whilst they last, if you go to thearmchairguide.com.au, you can get a physical copy of our book if you're prepared to pay for shipping. We'll send it out to you. Yep. Or, Ben, if you are still bootstrapping your research and your knowledge, you can go to Make Money Simple again, ben.com.au, and you can get a free copy of the digital book um, so that you can check it out. So that was just because Jack, Jack said he was going to read the book, so there's a way to, to go and get it for free. Ben, what do you think about that? So there, there's a fair bit going on here. And a lot. It, and it comes back to also um, what Jack's goal is. Um, we all know that capital growth is king when it comes to investing in property. You are getting an asset. The higher the asset grows, ultimately the more you will be able to charge for that asset as well. Um, but like everyone's circumstances, we all can't go out and buy the scarcest land in Australia, which is going to appreciate at the best value, right? So we have to have trade-offs. There are some trade-offs as part of that call. Now, obviously what Jack's doing is listening to different marketplaces and different opinions around what's out there. And there are huge amounts of opinions as to what's going to be a better story. My view has always been I'm not uh, I'm bipartisan in the sense that I don't care which city, um, which state that property is in. And as I consider my options, I do bring into things like land tax if I've already overexposed and undiversified in different, different locations. So for me, when someone says Bendigo or Ballarat, I'm like, yeah, really good yields. Uh, Bendigo, uh, you would probably argue, um, still struggles with access to Melbourne. Uh, it's just that road too far. Um, but that's not to say that over time it's not going to do all right. Ballarat, you know, an hour and six minutes by train, so, you know, and reasonable yields. But just remember, they're not going to grow as quick as the bigger cities are. Um, and when we talk about growth corridors, we always talk about the fact that there is risk in oversupply in those growth corridors. Melbourne is not landlocked. It does not have that challenge that we see in other cities. But when you look at Melbourne as a, as a brain centre and a centre for higher incomes and, and job opportunities and livability, it's off the charts. So you're going to get those high paying jobs and when you get those high paying jobs, you're going to have long term demand. And I'm on record as saying I definitely want people to own one property in Melbourne um, because we do know that Melbourne is going to be uh, Australia's largest city um, if it keeps going to trend uh, because of the affordability down here and everything that's happening in, re in regards to job opportunities. Now, I say that versus Bris Vegas. Now, with Bris Vegas is effectively we are talking about the merging of the Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast into one potential mega area over the next 40 or 50 years. So I still potentially see opportunity in that, in that market as well. Um, so it's about trying to get the location that has the best demand and supply, uh, not only for the short term, but also has longer scarcity of land um, and where you can get that best bang for buck. That's mm. it. Well done, Ben. Hey, I think it highlights the, um, the importance of um, not being a sort of wandering without a, a rudder, without yep. knowing where you're headed. Because you, you, you talked about it at the beginning, but I always find that if you, if you lack the, the goal or the, the, the sense of which direction you're heading, you can actually be easily blown off course by the next expert, what they've got. Because, you know, we, we've been doing this for a long time, Ben, and there's, there's, there's assets that we buy for clients that have got um, seven plus percent um, capital growth mm. precedent. Yep. And we're buying assets that have got um, well higher and we've got assets that might be sitting around five or six, depending on, on what it is mm. that the client actually needs. So I think it's really important for the listeners to know that, they, that on the ground, these are real decisions that our buying team have to have to balance up between why would I go to a certain location based on what, uh, what the brief is. And ultimately it comes from the client is very clear on knowing where they're heading. I've got this much to spend, I need this much growth, I need this much yield to fulfill mm. my own unique individual plan, that the, 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 the road that I'm walking on, not actually comparing myself to anyone else. And I think, you know, I can't impress upon Jack, who's about to embark on this journey, enough that you actually just need to know where you're going because people who uh, get engaged in barbecue conversations around my one's better than yours forget the fact that it doesn't really, it doesn't really take into account which destination that you're actually going towards. So if you have a, it's true, if someone has a budget of 500,000, well, they can't get in close 
in uh, Melbourne, but there are pockets of Brisbane that you can get in close. There are pockets of Adelaide that you can get in close. So that's number one that's really, really important. But two, understand with the absence of a clear goal, you are going to be susceptible to these barbecue chats about mine's better than yours. So be clear on that. Secondly, the point about growth corridors is they are actually growth corridors, but be very clear on what the growth is. (laughs) The growth of people moving there. And supply. (laughs) There's a growth of supply. It's not actually saying it's a capital growth corridor, although sometimes it's misheard or um, misused or misappropriated by the wrong people saying it's a capital growth corridor. What it's saying is the population is growing. We need to put people into housing stock. We need to put people into accommodation. And the growth is actually out towards these regions that are in the north, Ben, as you know. They're down in the south, Ben, as you know. They're out in the west, as you know. So be very, very clear that in Melbourne, you have this almost infinite um, sprawl that's available to you. So I find it interesting that uh, one of these people talk about Geelong, Ben. As you know, I live down at the Mm -hmm. surf coast. I see Geelong very, very regularly. And what I am seeing is subdivision after subdivision after subdivision going down there. So that is also a growth corridor. Mm. Doesn't necessarily mean a capital growth corridor, but there's lots and lots of people who are moving to these places that are affordable. But what I would say about Geelong is it's very built up. It's got a bay, Ben. It's got uh, a big highway at the back. It's got very established suburbs that have been around for a while. So in certain parts of Geelong, I would suggest that because of all those subdivisions, that would be making that scarcer and scarcer and more and more desirable. So therefore, if you're buying the right properties in those locations. So Jack, be very, very clear about a couple of things. What your goal is, where you're headed, because that will determine what the capital growth that you'll be acceptable. Be very clear on the definition of what a growth corridor is. It's a population growth corridor, not necessarily a capital growth corridor. And also thirdly, when it comes to hearing what someone says that a particular region, Geelong, for example, or if they might have an opinion on the Gold Coast or they might have an opinion on Adelaide or whatever, just just ask a little bit more about, well, I don't know anyone who's ever bought Geelong, Ben. I know someone who's bought a house in a street (laughs) in a suburb of Geelong, but I don't know anyone who's ever bought Geelong. So be very specific about what, um, what advice or mentoring you're taking as to what does that actually mean. Yeah, I love it. So planning is critical. Um, in terms of, I always say for, for those people just beginning, just understand you want to get in the game. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, Jack's made a, a pledge to try and get into the game by 2020 in December. Um, so to get in the game, cash flow is important. To stay in the game, cash flow is important. What's important about that? The surplus in that cash flow and any change in your cash flow, in the income coming in, because that are, that's going to determine what you can buy. So uh, the blend of assets, so whether it be high yielding um, and you're going to forego a little bit of growth, or you're going to try and get the magic of two, or you find those best locations which have also got some high yield, but some growth pent up demand there that will see some short term and then long term growth. Because once you get in and you get a bit of equity out of that property, you can then rinse and repeat into the next property and beyond. So great question. Good starter for our Q&A for 2020. 2020. Thank you, Jack. All right. The next one is Nick from Switzer- Switzerland. Ben. Switzerland. Hey, Switzerland. We've made it all the way to Switzerland. Hi, Bryson Ben. My name is Nick. I'm calling all the way from Switzerland, although originally from the northern beaches in Sydney. My wife and I are both from the northern beaches, but we have been working here in Europe for the past three years, and we're looking to buy our first property back in Australia, Ben. We're keeping an open mind and looking all over the country, so not necessarily in Sydney. We have a general question about what type of strategy we should be looking for being non-residents for tax purposes, but Australian nationals taking into account we can't take advantage of first homeowners grants or negative gearing as we have no income back in Australia. Originally, we were considering purchasing an apartment with potentially 5 to 6% rental yield with the idea of having a high yielding property so one, that can, uh, so one that can be potentially positively geared. Gee whiz, I'm stumbling over my words today, Ben. What are your thoughts on this, Ben? You have encountered this on a number of occasions. I have had, we have plenty of clients who are expats looking to uh, get their money back into Oz. There's a couple of things going on here. So um, the way in which Nick um, is talking is that there, this is an investment. Doesn't sound like it's going to be a PPOR. Um, they may have a goal of coming back into a certain location. So I would say uh, to you, Nick, uh, I would work on what that long-term vision looks like for coming back to Australia if you are planning to come back. Uh, because ideally, 
Um, what we normally advise our clients is to, if they can buy um, a, a footprint where they may move back into, yeah. that's a great starting point because mm-hmm. that will be their principal place of residence mm-hmm. at some point and that has an effect. Um, one of the things that a lot of people don't realise when they're a, a non-resident for tax purposes, and this is only general uh, commentary, um, it's not specific to Nick's circumstances because we can't give tax advice, but if you, are, if you are earning income in terms of rent that you get, Bryce, in Australia, that rent is offset against the costs mm-hmm. that you have in this country. Now, what that means is effectively you may be negatively geared, um, whereby the cost is greater, usually the interest, um, compared to the rental income that you get. Now, that loss can't be offset against foreign income. No. Um, as was pointed out here by Nick, um, b- but it is a but is the big but it carried is forward. carried forward. Mm. So in the event that that property eventually does come to be positively geared, then all of those losses that you have accrued over that time will be offset against that property. So let's say it's potentially Nick, money in the bank. They never come back. Let's mm. say they never come back. That is going to be offset against that income. So ultimately, the tax advantages are delayed. So if you're an expat and you're earning really great income and you want to deploy that income into assets, then I would highly recommend that Australia for the expat is a great place to do that. Now, there are some other tax legislations that are coming to pass in regards to ownership and selling properties um, that are going to play out. So we'll be talking about those in the coming weeks um, as that legislation gets more and more uh, clearer because we've got a few questions around it and we'll share that with those people for all of our expat listeners. But it, but in terms of what's happening here, um, I would always still go after a great asset in the best location that I can buy it in and if my cash flow allows for that to happen um, and then we can see them having uh, a one or two great properties. But if again, I wanted a principal place of residence to potentially come back and maybe that northern beaches of Sydney is not a bad place to start. Um, that story because it's also one of the hottest parts of Australia at the moment in terms of the level of demand and interest. Mm, true, Ben. What's not clear here is um, how cash flow strapped they are because yeah, yeah. there's a little hint here that they are chasing an apartment with five to six percent rental yield, and largely that's because of the fact that they're not getting those needed gearing benefits. Yeah, but that it's it doesn't necessarily give us a clue as to. Do they have the ability to fund any shortfall and they're playing the capital growth game yeah. and they're happy to have those carry forward losses that will be offset at some point in the future? Correct. And some of those yields you're talking about might come from you know, service departments and, and these types of accommodation which are, are promoted as, uh, as good high yielding investments. But we've talked about that before. Let's they, go back to the basics. Buy something the banks yep, like. You know, correct. Still. It's gross <laughs> yield and your costs on those types of things. And remember, costs on apartments... Um, are also very, very high. So you want to get a low-cost apartment uh, in the right locations and that has broad-reaching demand and appeal as opposed to something like a serviced apartment. And, uh, yeah, and yeah, well, we're using the word apartment. We often term to the stuff that we would buy be flat. So yep, flat. Is, is the apartment the same definition that we use as well? And just be wary, as Ben said, you know, if you are overseas and you... Uh, it, it is more important than ever that you make sure that there's uh, what the yield is after body corporate fees mm-hmm. if you are going to buy something that's got some medium to high density because 5 to 6% gross looks good, but uh, yeah. I want to know what the net is. Or like, like with Jack's question before about that investor who's following you buys everything in Melbourne, mm. after land tax... Mm. Like, what's the net you're getting after the land tax? You're doing great things for the for the state government's budget, but you're not necessarily doing great things for your own budget if you only buy in one city. Mm. Just crazy. So Ben, let's uh, let's let's give a summary then. So the strategy is simply um, uh, keeping in mind if you have a future need for it as a yep. place of residence. Yep. Also, being mindful of the fact that uh, you're not getting the negative gearing benefits, so you will still want to chase some form of yield, but make yep. sure it's not at the expense of the quality of the asset. Correct. And there's carried forward losses which you will eventually get back. Um, so let's, let's break that down. So let's say you made a loss. Let's just call it five thousand in yep. year one, and then year two you got another four thousand. Four thousand. Yep. So at the end of year two you would have carried forward losses of nine thousand. Correct. The following year it would add by the next yep. amount. Again, that's not tax advice. Please talk to your uh, trusted advisor. But essentially what that means is, say you had that nine thousand offset, Ben, and then you came and earned nine thousand dollars. Well, then that's already tax-free money. Correct. 
Um, so Correct. that would roll forward. So Correct. hopefully that's helped. Nick, shout out to us because um, it would be clear to have a better understanding of um, what your cash flow position is like, but um, hopefully that gives you and everyone else who's trying your story on for size. Thank you for our question all the way from Switzerland. That's cool. I oh, know. Thank you from Switzerland. Hey, Nikki, um, Nikki doesn't tell us where she's from, but upgrade now or later based on an economic forecast, Ben? Mm. Hi, it's currently... Uh, Mid-June, oh, just to show Ben that uh, we, we do try and get to as many questions yes, as we can. Yes, we do. We, it's yep. taken us about six months to get to this. Oh, it's currently June 27, 2019. <laughs> currently, my husband and I purchased a three-bed, two-and-a-half bath, two-garage, 243-square townhouse. Square metres, yep. Freehold in prime real estate, Hawthorne, Brisbane. Oh, nice suburb. We have been provided by market experts that we could get 830 to 850 for the sale of our property. We're currently wanting to upgrade to live in a better area. Wow, big call, Hawthorne. We would be best with the uh, would we be best with the economic forecast over the next couple of years to keep that property as an investment property before upgrading to a property just in the very low millions. Ben, if if Nikki could, or if we could share the story of thousands of people that we've counselled in this particular area. If you can hold on to a property, I mean, just ask your parents if they ever did sell and upgraded, you know, whether they wish they had kept the property that they bought, the first one that they bought. I would say there'd be very few that would say, no, I I, I regret it. They all regret it, you know, in terms of they should all have kept that property. So this for me is a really simple answer. If you can afford it, and you can afford it not only today, but into the future, and if we're having kids and we're, or that's already, if we've got really strong incomes, hold the property, hold the fort, uh, build the asset base up. The greater the asset mm-hmm. base you can build, the better your wealth position will be for the medium to longer term. And ultimately, this is gonna be an income producing asset. So um, it bodes well uh, for the asset base that you'll have in retirement. So it's a real simple question. If you can afford to, please hold on to it because Townhouse in those locations, uh, good price point. Um, and you're saying here, we might be able to do that and hold on to the property in, the, in a very low millions. Brilliant. That's called accumulation. Mm-hmm. We love property accumulation. It's very helpful. Well, you talked about townhouse that's freehold, Ben. So it's cl- that would suggest that um, we're, not, uh, we're not in a strata. So no, that's a tick. Even better. Now, for those people who are not um, s- uh, familiar with Brisbane's landscape, let's just set the scene. Hawthorne yep. with an E, mm-hmm. not like Melbourne without an E. Hawthorne with an E is a river south side blue chip suburb. It, it is. It has some of the most magnificent uh, Queensland, as you ever want to set your eyes yep. on in that suburb. Yep. It is amazing. So It's got a nice vibe, easy to walk to street. You know, it's so good. It's got a cat that, is, yep. got, mate, you get this amazing river cruise to yep. drive. Like people, Straight think of into people work. that are on trams and trains and yep. all that. These guys, these guys get a river cruise, mate, to get <laughs> into, it's a Brisbane the on river. the river yep. cat. It's amazing. Yep. So the real estate, the location is amazing. The only thing I can think of, Ben, is I remember when I was... Um, I was, it was 1993. My dad grew up in uh, Ranelagh Crescent in South Perth, for those yep. folks in Perth. Shout out to Dr. Colin, who yep. also lives in that street, um, who's also a client of ours. He, he gives me updates on my grandpa's house all the time. <laughs> um, so my dad li- lived in this um, red um, clinker brick house, yep. and um, my dad was going to buy it. And so my dad tells the story around, uh, so this is the one that got away, right? Yeah, so yeah, And yeah. It's, it's got context of all mm-hmm. of them. It my dad does. was going to buy it. And then what happened is um, it was owned by um, Homes West, um, which is the... Yep, the social housing correct. mob in so, WA. Yep. So my grandfather used to rent it. My dad lived there and he got, well, I'm going to buy it. And it would have just been like anyone else who's got a mortgage that gives them a little bit of a, mm-hmm. you know, it's tight. But it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't mind-blowing. Yeah. Now, to set the scene, if you stand at the front of Grandpa's house, Ben, you've got this beautiful green grass that then has the Swan River with the most amazing view <laughs> of the Perth Skyline. So I'm sure everyone's catching the story here. Yeah, my, yeah. my dad then met my mum. Therefore, he wasn't able to, at the time, and with the mindset at the time, buy that and, yeah. as well as, so he did Plan it. for the future. Yeah. And then, so, so then the state um, auctioned it when my grandfather passed away in 93, Ben, and it went for $993,000, right? Oof. Now you think, that's a lot of money now, but yeah. rewind, we're talking 1993. Yeah. So it was a lot of cash because the location was amazing. So that would be the advice I'd give to Nikki that 
Hawthorne with an E in Brisbane yep. is a river suburb that is uber blue chip. And, and we know it's a townhouse, mm-hmm. so that's that's all good. So there will be a little bit of extra supply coming into there. There'll be more and more. To, but, but it's hard it's to actually get supply in, in Hawthorne. Belim- Belimba's got a big um, yep. development with lots, and Norman yep. Park's got a little bit as well. But Hawthorne, it's very much landlocked. Correct. Um, so it applies all, this, all the rules of scarcity, Ben. Yep. You've got these period appeal houses. You've got you know, proximity to um, your job very, very easily. So let us know what you decided to do, Nikki. That's, I'd be interested to see whether you're able to hold on to that. This would be best with the economic forecast over the next couple of years. I'm interested to know what the forecast is that's, that's, that's concerning them. Because if you have a look yeah. at any long range forecast for our country, all of the capital cities are expected, <laughs> even Darwin, who's uh, probably yep. our poor cousin with our real estate at the results moment. at the moment. Yep. Every, every single city is expecting more population uh, to come into them. So more population in an area like that, yeah. um, hopefully. Yeah, I don't think Brisbane as a city is going to close down anytime soon. <laughs> no, I, I, I suspect that there, we are going to see uh, businesses and industry uh, and service companies uh, thriving in the Brisbane and the greater southeast region. Mm-hmm. And, and there's going to be people want to live in nice locations. Mm-hmm. Well, Hawthorne's one of them. So hopefully you can hold on to it, Nikki. And hopefully, Ben, hopefully. Nikki has all her money in offset against and hasn't paid off the loan. Yep. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> so there you go, Nikki. Hopefully that's been of help to you. All right, Craig, on selling a property at a loss, Ben, or wait to recoup Ooh, losses. That's, the, that's the hook. That's the hook. All right, let's have a little listen to Craig's question now. Good afternoon, Property Couch. My name is Craig, and I have a question. Uh, my partner and I currently own three investment properties between us. Two of these properties are performing quite well in terms of growth and low upkeep. The third investment property in Darwin was originally brought as a place of residence and is not performing well as an investment. The market has had a 32% downturn and is unlikely to recover anytime soon. My question is, should we consider selling the Darwin investment at a loss, however still walk away with approximately $30,000 to reinvest uh, into a new or existing investment? Or should we hang on to this investment long term with the intent of recuperating our losses, even though this property costs us about $8,000 a year? Thank you for your time. Good question, Ben. The classic dilemma. Mm. Sell or hold, Bryce. Mm-hmm. Sell or hold. Now, again, it's very difficult, Craig, for us to uh, just with you know five lines of text to basically say what you can and can't do in this particular circumstance. But it, it does highlight what you do need to do in terms of that research. There's a couple of things in here. Principal place of residence. Well, we never pay... Um, any tax on our principal place of residence currently, right? That's that's how the law is at the moment. You never know with governments um, of either side what they're going to do. Um, but principal place of residence is capital gains tax free. Now, you've obviously turned this into an investment property and, and since moved away, um, and you've experienced a deterioration in the value of that property. Now, it's from that time point that, that you've had the, the capital value of that property or the valuation of that property to the valuation today from the time that it's been a rental property is potentially going to be what a capital loss may look like for you. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of work that you need to do with your tax advisor um, in terms of what that figure looks like because that's going to come into the consideration in terms of future plans around what what you uh, plan to acquire and whether at some point into the future you are going to divest of your investment properties um, or one of them um, because that carried forward loss could be material, um, especially when we're talking about a 32% mm-hmm. downturn. And you're still going to have 30000 currently um, in terms of what we would refer to as recycle funds to be able to invest into somewhere else. So um, if we look at the economics of Darwin, um, it continues to struggle. Uh, it may be struggling for at least the next three to four, five years in terms of what that story looks like. So um, the question is opportunity cost, which you well point out. So, I mean, I, I know we talk about this before, but we do a detailed analysis in the seller hold. I know it's our research platform. I know I'm doing a, a plug for it, but have a look at sellorhold.com.au. Run the numbers. It's free to sort of put your preliminary numbers in there. Um, and then you'll get an insight in terms of what holding that property is going to look like. And then you've got to make a decision in terms of whether you think you can get a better return on investment 
somewhere else. Yeah, because it, it, cause how much is it costing you to hold it? Is all of the is all of the loss just a balance sheet loss and mm. a cash flow? It's fine, and it's also about having a think with your accountant or your trusted financial person yep. about yep. what major events are coming up in the future. Yep. You know, in terms of timing a loss with a gain at some point. So there's a, there's a fair bit going on there. Yeah, a good qualifier. If you want to do it yourself, that's the seller whole thing. If you want a professional to do it for you then look for a qualified property investment advisor mm. who does this types of an analysis. Now, they will charge you for their time um, and it won't be you know, a couple of hundred dollars. It'll be more significant than that. But if you want to know where the opportunity is and, the, and in terms of where your money starts making more money for you, uh, that's what you want to know, right? That's making the invisible visible and they should be able to give you some idea in terms of if you were to redeploy that money into a new location, when would you be back in front again? Um, and then you make an informed decision as opposed to a guess. And that's important. Yeah, because Craig, it's probably worth um, uh, sort of giving you some encouragement that we have had plenty of scenarios where people have come into our office, uh, done some planning process, and they've had a what they would consider a dud. And in some cases, yeah. we trade through that so that they can keep it and it might be performing cash flow wise. Um, and there's other times when it just makes sense uh, to do it. So there's no, there's no, you know, it's horses for courses. Correct. We've got no emotion attached to it, mm. right? Ultimately, we, are, we would traditionally be a hold versus a sell. Mm -hmm. We want to see a compelling argument for a sell, but so do you. I mean, ultimately, you need to see, again, the, the numbers and the uh, due diligence of what's gone on in regards to doing that work. So um, it is a conversation potentially with a professional, um, but you can start off by kicking, kicking the worksheets through the uh, sellerhold.com and, and Dot au and, and have a look at it, look at that. Oh, I, I guess you, you did say that, Ben. The the, the point of sellerhold.com, sure, there is a commercial um, yep. thing for us, but there is a free bit that gives yep. you an, an, an awesome amount of um, information. Well, to, you'll start to you understand your about. capital gains loss. Yeah, because it's just capital gains loss in this case. So you can all the questions are in there that will give you that estimate. Um, that you can then validate with, with your a in cost, your recycle costs, Correct. your out costs, and yep. some of the things that you haven't, you might not have even thought about just to start um, lubing the thought process for you. An informed investor is a smart investor. Yeah, very good. So hopefully they help Craig. Hey, got this one from Scott Ben. Yes. Uh, let's have a listen to Scott's question. Hi guys, Scott here. I've been on board following the podcast since April 2015 and have loved the journey. Almost five years in and I thought it was finally time to hit you up for some advice. My wife Teresa and I live in regional WA with our two kids aged seven and nine. Both of us work full time for a state government department and we currently earn 270k a year gross combined. We own two properties in our hometown of Perth. Our first house in Bibra Lake, shout out to Bryce, which is valued at 430 with 350 owing. Our other property is a 1940s weatherboard cottage, 5Ks from the city with owner-occupier appeal, valued at 630 with 500 owing. So our total LVR is about 80%. Both loans are, are interest only and both properties have reliable tenants in them, paying 350 and 410 a week respectively. We aren't big spenders and have no personal car or help loans. Due to this and the fact that our employer has heavily subsidised our rent whilst we live regionally, we've quietly amassed savings of 320K, which currently sits in an offset account. We intend on staying in the bush for at least another two years before we're heading back to the big smoke. And in this time, we anticipate the 320 we currently have will grow by 75k each year in which we don't do anything with it. However, I'm sensing there's a huge opportunity cost here if we leave things any longer. Any advice as to what our next move should be would be very much appreciated. Keep up the seller work, guys. Wow. Good savings record. Unbelievable savings record. I mean, when we talk about, I look at these numbers and I go, potential potential, potential, <laughs> opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. Because um, I can quickly do the numbers, 430 valuation on one property, 630 on the other, that's a million and 60, yep. right? We've got debt of 350 and debt of 500, so our debt is 850. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the OVR he refers to as 80%. Mm -hmm. But he's not factoring in the money in the offset. <laughs> an offset. So this is, a, this is also really important for people to understand because we assume that people might understand this. So our job is to sort of explain that your, your uh, LVR, your loan to value ratio, when you focus in on that 320 of offset, is actually, your true debt is really 530. So if you were to take that 320 and plug that into a loan, then effectively your debt is only 530, which means your, your LVR is 50%. Now, if I saw an LVR at 80%, I'm saying, no, oh, yeah, no, let's just sit back and wait until we get a little bit more equity in the properties. But no, no, 
what we need to be doing is these guys have an amazing opportunity. Scott and Co have an amazing opportunity to um, uh, to accelerate that in terms of what that looks like for them. However, it comes back to personal goals. What's your goal here? What do you want to achieve? We can make more money for you. Mm. Um, there's there's no doubt. There's a massive opportunity here. You yeah. have you have money that's not working hard for you. You could have money that could be working significantly hard for you and Teresa. Um, so it's important to understand that. And then it is about you know like you, you've obviously very uh, conservative with your spending. You've you've documented that for us. So really strong incomes, two seventy gross household income combined. Um, what do you want to do? I mean, you know, if you're not living a big lifestyle and you don't want to live that big lifestyle in retirement, then you probably could just keep saving and pay those two off and that's it. But if you want $100,000 in passive income or you want to have, you know, a really, you know, travel Europe for six months of the year or 12 months a year and never have to worry about money and, and having true what we call financial peace and mm-hmm. financial freedom, mm-hmm. then we can, there, there's more work that can be done here that, you know, we can accelerate that wealth accumulation here for you, and you could uh, you could be investing. And the fact that you've got two in WA means you could also look at borderless. You could look at borderless, Ben. I think it all comes down to point of view, doesn't it? Because we sit here and we go, oh my gosh, there's opportunity. <laughs> right. Whereas, so the first question that I'd want to know from Scott and Teresa is what's your risk profile? Because, yeah. and is being in the bush uh, a sacrifice to you? Because I know a lot of people in Western Australia, they. Uh, give up going living in Perth, for example, so that they can go to a mining town or whatever yep. to earn big bucks because yep. they're on big bucks. But so I'd, I'd question to you, what fruit from that sacrifice do you want? Yeah. Is the fruit from the sacrifice knowing that you've got plenty of cash in the bank, any sort of world shock X factor event that happens this year, you do not have to lose a, a, a wink of sleep? Well, then that's one thing versus someone who says, hey, look, I made this sacrifice and I really want to make it to the best financial advantage that I can. Mm. Well, we're suggesting at a 50% LVR, there's, there's definitely opportunity for you. But it's interesting that, uh, well, I, I would like to know what your risk profile is, to be honest, but um, there's clearly opportunity. I mean, you could, with the $320,000, you could actually be buying a, a property that's got pretty good yield, cash almost mm. for that, um, still whilst uh, preserving the, the cash in a very you know, moderate risk mm. uh, asset um, that you could still cash out. Well, surplusing around that sort of $37,500 per annum, so if it's 75000 more that we're going to have, there's no, they're going to have 150 more in two years. Oh, okay. So that's so it's oh, going, each going year. to go up to half a million. Oh, of course, it's so it's each year. My bad. I'm thinking over the next couple of years. No, so it's all right. People know you're a Collingwood supporter, mate. They know that sometimes it takes a little while for you to catch up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's, it then comes down to okay, risk profile. What do you want to do for the kids? Mm. What do you want to do for your namesake? What do you want to do? Do you want to build up a a wealth base that could potentially set up a trust? Um, for the next generation of your lineage that will go and be all schooled and giving them the best opportunity, knowing that the work that you've done has set up your your future generations, that could be of interest to you. It could be, no, no, I want to have a private butler on the 2EQ because we've worked really hard, we've made sacrifices, we've gone bush, and I want to have a, Q, you know, a private butler on the QET and travel around the world for a year and see all of these amazing things that I've been reading about whilst I've been in the bush or, you know, whatever it is. So, so once you understand your why um, in terms of what your motivation is, that then correlates to why you would do this because, quite frankly, just keep doing what you're doing and you're going to have a comfortable retirement if you've got comfortable living standards. Um, if you want to have improved living standards or you want to reward yourself for this delayed gratification, then um, you've potentially got opportunity to, uh, to fast-track your wealth accumulation if you want to retire earlier. That's also a possibility here because the levers we've got, you've got really strong income, expenditure's low, so it's it's time and target that we're going after in terms of what we're trying to do. And if your target's big because you want to leave a significant legacy to your two kids or um, it's, it's all about paying it forward or whatever that is, You've got an opportunity here. What a great story. So remember what the game is for financial freedom, where your passive income, not your active income, this is a Robert Kiyosaki classic from his Rich Dad Poor Dad, yep. where your passive income is greater than your expenses. Now, you've said your expenses are small. So therefore, your your definition of financial freedom could come up very, very quickly, given if that's what you continue to want to do going forward, and particularly as you retire out some of that debt. So folks, 
Um, there is there is some really good opportunity here for you, and there's opportunity for our community to see too, Ben, that um, that un, un, um, uh, underutilized assets could be costing you money. You said yep. opportunity costs. So if your risk profile allows, um, Scott and Teresa, I think there's opportunity for you to potentially add more assets to but your But notice how we're not going, on. you got to do this. this is so much. Yeah. But that's the point. The point being is, you know, thank you for reaching well, Early out. on in my career, I would have been, but now yeah, I've yeah. kind of I've done enough of these, been seen a few radios where people, and coming out of my sort of uh, sheltered Perth lifestyle, that people are driven by, by so much more than just having more money in the bank. But if yep. that's... If that's if you're happy with you are no problem, but if you want some fruit for the sacrifice, I think there's an opportunity to totally agree. Money. Brilliant. Hey, this last one, Ben, uh, is from David. Hey, Ben and Bryce, really been enjoying the podcast. I've been a bit of a unique question at the moment. I live with my parents, and I'm in my mid twenties, and I'm looking to subdivide a bit of their land as housing prices are a bit too expensive for a single income. I was wondering if I classify for the first home buyers grant if I build on their land and whether the actual certificate of title transfer needs to come onto my name or it can remain in their name. <laughs> Cheers, David. Well, so I think there's, a, there's just some clarification here, right? The actual ownership of title is on the land itself, not on the improvements on the land. Mm-hmm. So you need to own title of land or strata um, if it's not freehold um, or different types of ownership. But ultimately that needs to transfer into your name. So you cannot say, I want the, the first home buyer's grant because I'm oh, building a dwelling, own. which is referred to as an improvement on, on the land. Um, no, it's a simple answer that the title must transfer into your name. Um, and if it does, that is a transaction that's occurring. And under those circumstances, this will be your first parcel of land of which you will be building your own home on, which will uh, allow you to potentially access the grant so long as you take ownership of that and you also pay the uh, the uh, stamp duty on the transfer of that land as it is valued at that time. The end. Enough said. Well answered, it. Ben. I like it. So hopefully that's helped you, David. Thank you for your question. Thank you for yours too, Scott and Teresa. Uh, we also had a great question from Craig, Ben. Uh, we also had one from Nikki, from Nick from Switzerland and Jack regarding Brisbane versus Melbourne. So that was a bit of fun, Ben, just to kick off the year with our Q&A. Get them, keep, please keep them coming in. We love Q&A Day. We will continue to do more and more of them throughout the year on a big 2020 that we've got planned on the property couch. Ben, my life hack today. Yes. Now, Ben, I think, I'm not sure I've had too many conversations with you, but Andrew and I have both been sleep preservers for us. Uh, with the kids, we love sleep to the point where um, my wife has bought two big block out blinds. Whenever we go and stay somewhere, we take them traveling with us so we can put them up on the window so the kids can actually not have sun beaming in at five o'clock <laughs> in the morning because the risk, we don't want them waking up at five instead of seven. Right, yeah. Um, we are... Uh, 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 we have had children that have slept from 7 till 7, Ben, uh, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, when they were younger. I know there's listeners who just want to reach out and stab me right now because <laughs> there are plenty of listeners who are struggling with sleep. And I want to say that um, uh, uh, friends of ours who had kids before us, they said, you've got to read this book, Ben. It was called Save Our Sleep by Tizzy Hall. Yeah. And it was all about how you get the kids into a, um, a sleep rhythm. And we did it. We did it to the letter. And I remember... I remember, I'm telling this backstory to get to my life hack, okay? So yeah, yeah, no, they're, it's they're, good. I'm, I'm with you. I'm curious as to whether it's still it's, happening. It still works, right? Still so works. the kids have always been yeah. good sleepers. They've gone seven till seven. And then, um, uh, but what happened is when Samuel came along, who's, who's just turned seven, yep. um, uh, I said to Andrew, I know you did it with Jack. Well done. We did a great job. Um, but we're just not, it's not going to happen with Sam. We're tired. I'm traveling. I'm coming home. I'm getting home on weekends. I'm exhausted. She just gave me this look of... Mate, <laughs> you watch me. My sleep is important. You, you, you yeah. watch me. And so she did actually transition Sam into it. So that was just the background that we are always trying Very to pres- good. preserve the sleep for the kids. So we've got this, we've got this um, what we call the kids' highway strategy, Ben. Yep. Because we, under no circumstances do we want the boys to fall asleep uh, in the afternoon. Because <laughs> what it means is they'll be, going, they'll be awake at 10 yes, o'clock at night. Yeah, yes. Midnight won't happen. So as you know, we're going to drive up and down the uh, Geelong Highway yes. or take long trips. So we have what we call our Kids Highway 9-Minute Strategy. Yep. So we do not want them both on technology, right, for the entire trip because Correct. anyone who's got uh, young kids, Ivis, you'll learn this over time, that um, if your kids are in the car watching an iPhone for extended periods of time, just watch the meltdown when you get home. and It's just horrific, right? Mm-hmm. So what we decided is, well, if we're going to preserve the sleep, um, for me and Andrew to make sure. 
but we don't want them to be on an iPhone. How do we serve th those two masters? So what we did is we now just give them one phone, Ben, in the highway, uh -huh. one phone which they've got to swap between them. So they have a nine minute strategy. So they can do what they want for nine minutes yeah. and then we set it. So the other person is watching the clock like a hawk, right, to make sure they, they know yeah. when it's their turn. So they're setting mini goals, they've got a little bit of del delayed gratification. Importantly, they're not falling asleep in. Like it. But here's a little kicker, right, because you're going to come to the point where, uh, come on Sam, it's Jack's turn. Oh, I just want to finish this. So, I, And after that, I'm thinking yeah. this isn't working. Yeah. So what I do now is I say, all right, Jack, uh, you, you keep count. However many minutes it takes for Sam to pass it over, you can get two minutes so you can take some of his time. <laughs> Sam hands it straight to him straight away because the idea of his brother getting one of his minutes is right up there with just like poking his own Good eye strategy. the sharp stick. Good strategy. So what do we got? Delayed gratification. We've got mini goal setting, Ben. Um, of course, we, we avoid the massive meltdowns that come uh, with the overload of screen time. And of course, it uh, the overall goal here, which is what this is all about, <laughs> it means that Andrew and I don't have to wait up until 10.30, yeah, 11 o'clock at night yes. uh, with the kids awake. So that's watching, watching, taking screens away from children. Oh, <sighs> yeah, because we're one of those families where we, we don't want our kids watching screen time, but there's yeah. some times where it's yeah, like, they're gonna how go, oh, the dickens am I going to get around this? Jack so on the weekend, my God, like he was just... <laughs> Every time I'm going to say, man, I'm going to start filming you now. Like, oh, like you just have these little <laughs> tantrums. What are you going to do with it? You can put like, up YouTube. Yeah. So there's <laughs> so the show. Oh, oh no. Nice. Did so you know, Ben? Did you know? Well, a couple of little ones. Just yeah. a quick one. Yeah. Today's date, Bryce. Yeah. What, what have we got? Oh, I don't know, mate. Is it, is it, uh, is I'd, it? Say, I'd say there's something significant about it. Uh, is it? Is it? <laughs> no, it's a 20th, 02, 2020? Yeah. Oh, so so there's a the couple of 20s and there's a couple of O2s there, and some zeros yeah. and some twos. So there, did you know? Is that, so that's it, good luck. So, so uh, <laughs> b before we move on to your other, did you know, yeah. are you going to acknowledge any source around that or is that just the one you came up with? Oh, no, Ivis, thank oh, you, Stiggy. <laughs> Stiggy, thank you for that little did you know. It was great work right at the end. I do have another did you know that I prepared earlier. Yeah. yeah. yeah you know me. If oh, if only the listeners knew what the that truth preparation is, looked like. They come in and say, we've got a did you know for us? And I go, just a minute. <laughs> and I go out Oh, let's room. tell the full story. Well, okay. Let's tell the full story. waiting in here for you and then couldn't. So Ivis, Ivis calls the uh, early podcast record, right? Yep. So yep. so it, it overlaps with one of my meetings and I tried to get there, but it was 15 minutes. So you were in here... Uh, 20 Hence minutes longer got, preparing. First time I got to read the questions. Yeah. Yeah. And then you've given me one of those, <laughs> that's okay, mate. Doesn't matter that you've walked in late, you know. Doesn't Whereas matter. Whereas you're fully prepped. I so I'm ready to go. Very encouraging. I'm ready to go, was... Ivis. And I am saying, right, Ben, and, and it's the same question I ask every week, Ivis, is it any different? <laughs> Have you got your did you know? And he just looked blank. <laughs> uh, I know I've been prepping for the questions. He's all just smug. I've prepped for the questions. Oh, mate, <laughs> I, I understand you're late. I wasn't late. rude. I wasn't rude. But he hasn't done the most funny thing. Anyway, folks, did you know this is a source from our Good friends at the REIA, Real Estate Institute mm -hmm. of Australia. I thought we'd just go back on, you know, in terms of the amount of investment lending going on, Bryce. We were having a bit of a chat we were. Uh, last week about this, but I thought oh, I'd like a bit of a chat. So where did it peak? It peaked in June of 2015, yeah, it was big. where investment lending reached 43% of all new lending being done. We talked about that being unsustainable. Remember the next month we were talking about that, no, 43% basically in terms of, you know, investment lending peaked in terms of share of market. Now, Ooh. number two, so historic average. So, okay, 43% was its peak. Ooh, yeah. The historical average has been 34.4%, mm. okay, to, of loans that go to investors. So it was 33% higher, Ben, of the th if you think. Oh, yes, not bad, Bryce. Mm. Good job there. <laughs> um, good number crunching <laughs> in thin air. Good job. Um, or in your mind. I'll thin just air. help you with your thin air. Is probably good. the mind as well. <laughs> <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Okay, and the last one, just to keep on track here. Thank you very much. Um, current numbers, only 256 so a portion of overall home loans currently going to investors Ooh. is at lows. Mm. Very, very low time. Well, we, did um, we did talk about that, but what yeah, we yeah. think is a, a lot of that's actually come out of the new and uh, sort of medium Agreed. high density and the offer plan. Uh, the offer, plans the offer stuff. plan and the house and land packages are on the nose, right, for investors. They're finally getting it, which is great news. Um, uh, hopefully, hopefully podcasts like ours are making a contribution. Well, let's People hope so. Pivoting yes. away from some wrong decisions and making some right Because it'd be nice to keep it at that sort of level so people don't get stung in buying those um, those medium and high density apartment blocks that are homogenous and 
built on mass. Hmm. Um, that's the stuff that doesn't perform. So there you go, Bross. Just uh, some did you know numbers around investment lending oh. as it currently stands from our friends at the Real Estate Institute of Australia. Australia, very good, Ben. No, I did not know that. Thanks for the update, uh, folks. There you go. Hopefully that was helpful. Thanks to all those who contributed. Hopefully hearing their stories or their questions helped you with maybe one of the questions that you might have had. But if you've got uh, something that you want us to handle on the podcast, go to Ibis Facebook, info at the property couch. There's a whole range of ways to reach out to us. Um, but we'd love to tackle those in an upcoming episode, Ben. But until next week. Wow, just quick little plug for selectresidentialproperty.com.au. Remember our specials, 20% off, yep. TPC20 for locationscore.com.au, suburbgrowth.com.au. Only so available to our community. Only maybe. to our community. So it finishes at the end of February. That's why I was giving a quick shout out. But Brosh, remember, knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on, on it. it. Love it. See you next week, folks. Hey there folks, Bryce Holdaway here. Before you go, if you're new to our community and only listen to maybe a handful of episodes, I thoroughly recommend that you go all the way back to episode number one, where we unpack all of the foundations when it comes to property investing. Now for those of you that might be a little bit time poor, I've got good news for you. We have a binge guide that you can download straight away, which summarizes the first 20 episodes where Ben and I unpack the foundational pillars of the ABCD and so much more, and you can get that straight away. If you go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20, you can download it and consume it whenever you want. It's completely free and available now. And for those of you, just a quick reminder that nothing we've spoken about today constitutes financial advice. We recommend that you reach out to your licensed professional advisor so that you can look at your unique circumstances before acting on any information. Now don't forget, go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20 and get your binge guide today.